You think it's murder? I mean, clearly it's murder. What can I do to help? Yeah, that's me. But February, I mean, that was months ago. What's that got to do with Simon's murder? I didn't murder Simon. You've got it wrong. You've got the wrong person. I'd like to speak to a lawyer now. Please. You have no murder weapon. You have nothing. And all these stories we've been telling each other. Just that. Stories. Simon. Simon Smith. He works at Ernst Brothers Glass. They do windows, all kinds of glass. Simon does the more special work. Mirror making, feature windows, artistic things. Really beautiful things. Um, Simon is six foot, darkish blonde, so he shaves it. It's all that matters really, the baby. <laughs> Simon's dead, but the baby, that's how he will live on. Our baby. It's the Rockington Arms, The Rock. It's run by a nice couple, Peter and Susan. There's some other regulars there that Simon likes to drink with, and the barmaid they're having sometimes, Helen. Peter said Simon had been in and had a few drinks. Yes, there's an Amstrad one. No one uses it for very much. There's a printer so you can write letters on it. Simon sometimes plays games, you know, climb the tower, save the princess, that kind of thing. Simon isn't the type to run off or do anything crazy. Someone must have done something to him or there must have been some kind of accident. So what do we do next? You think it's murder? I mean, clearly it's murder. What can I do to help? <laughs> yeah. Well, they've gone to bed feeling ill, thinking it was flu or something. The neighbour called me, I had to use my key to let them in. We found them dead in their bed. And they'd been there for days, no one had noticed. Just awful. It was so soon after my miscarriage, in the worst year of my life, and I'd been so happy to get married, and after that it was just like, fuck. 
It was supposed to be a secret. Just because Simon is dead doesn't mean I have to give up all his secrets. It doesn't have anything to do with what happened to Simon. No one murdered my husband because he cheated his expenses for a romantic weekend in Oxford. Rehearsed? You ask me the same question, you'll get the same answer. Is that your evidence? Of course I thought about what happened then. It's all I've thought. You're reaching here. And I don't know why. No, I've never cheated on anyone. I've never taken anything from anyone. Simon is dead. But I have my baby to care for. Why are you trying to make me sad? Why are you so obsessed with sex and affairs? Really? You're going to ask me about my sex life? I mean, isn't that private? Are you married? How is your sex life? So, our sex life is probably fairly average for a couple after 10 years of marriage. No, you're talking to the wrong person if you think I'm some kind of slut. If you think I'm the kind of person that would have had sex with all those guys. No, um, I was 15. Carl was older, 17 I think. I was really into him, regardless of how he actually behaved. Lots of drunken teenage sex. We did it in a church once. It's stupid. So he got tired of us and we split up after about six months. It was sad, but those early experiences, they help you realise who's really important to you, you know? There was a conference, something to do with double glazing, in Oxford. Are you sure? What would he be doing in Oxford if there was no conference? I remember calling him. He said it was boring and he spent most of the time at the bar. No. I told her it was one of my boyfriends, someone I had met in the bar. I think she was happy. But I could tell she was thinking, why couldn't it happen to her and Simon? They were the ones with the real life. Why not them? I guess you could call it that, but we were both, both happy to get married. It was a beautiful wedding. <laughs> we had our first dance to come back and stay. I'm not sure if that's a good wedding song, but I loved it. I chose it. I mean, it was genuinely our first dance. We'd never danced together before. It was probably awful to watch, but I enjoyed it. It felt like it was just me and Simon for that moment. Just the two of us. From when I woke up. Okay. I, uh, I woke up, Simon was already up, and he made me birthday breakfast of eggs We saved presents to later. And um, Simon, happy birthday. It's Rapunzel. The story starts when she's born. 
Mother Gothel, a witch, takes Rapunzel from her parents and keeps her locked up in this tower. Rapunzel gets pregnant by the prince, and Mother Gothel is furious, so she cuts off her hair and throws it. Actually, her hair's already short here, so that's already happened. But she throws her into the wilderness, and Rapunzel is reunited with the prince, who's Sam and Eric arguing? No, I can't imagine they'd be arguing. And they get on so well. Unless it was something to do with work. Maybe Simon was being too much of a perfectionist. But I don't know. You should ask Diane. Yeah, we were 17. It was a nice wedding, people said. Simon looked very handsome in the photos. His parents paid for everything, but he's an only child, so it was important to them. It was what they called a shotgun wedding, but if you looked at the photos, you couldn't tell. The dress was beautiful. It looked like Princess Diana's. The train wasn't quite as long, though. There's a great photo of the bridesmaid helping to carry it out of the car. There were always princes and princesses. They were the special people, more important than the other characters in their stories. We knew we were like that. Twins. Magical. We were the princesses. We had a poster of Princess Diana from the newspaper up in our attic. Had a pride of place. We were obsessed with everything she did. And later, when her life went so bad, we felt for her. Her divorce last year just kind of drew a line under things. He was wearing um, a shirt, with a blue turtleneck shirt and jeans. He has a watch, it's a really nice one, that was a gift from his boss, Eric. Mm, he had his coat, a long grey duffel coat, like Paddington Bear. Uh, he would have taken that with him, it's not in the house. So, it was Friday evening, we had an argument, he left. On Saturday he didn't come back, I waited all day. He was supposed to go help Eric out with something on the Saturday afternoon, they had a job, but he didn't show. So Eric was ringing on the phone. I checked at The Rock, that's our local. They said they'd seen him on the Friday night, but not since. He still wasn't back this morning, it just isn't like him at all. Still not back by dinner time. It's getting dark again. So I decided to come see you. His parents haven't heard anything either. Yes, there's a car that we share, a Cavalier, and a van he uses for work. It's owned by Eric, but we look after it. Both of them are there now, parked in the street. Yes. That would be in his wallet. It's a visa, a silver one. He usually pays with cash, but... Well, Eric was like an uncle to him. They were pretty close. They spend a lot of time with each other, especially when they have to go to conferences. The rock. We've spoken to everyone there. Someone must have seen where he went. I don't know. 
so many things could have gone wrong. No, no one has been in the last few weeks. We had a plumber come in three, four weeks ago. Someone sang with you from the rock. I wasn't in the house all of Friday night. After the argument, after Sandy left, I left too. I was upset and I wanted to get away. So I took the car. Sure, yes, of course, if that would help. Will you phone the house to let me know when you want to come round? Then I can make sure that I'm there. He has a wallet, a huge, silly thing. Leather, real leather, I think. He packs it full of stuff, business before. I wasn't in the house. No, he was as shy as me. I asked, well, I asked a friend to ask him out for me. We had our first date at the Odeon in North End. We went to see Risky Business. I had on my one best dress. Simon paid. He bought me a whisper, and I was worried about getting chocolate on my teeth. Simon's parents offered to put me up, but I didn't think it would be a good idea. It would be too sad. Not right now. Well, my friend Eve. I mean, she was a friend from when I was a kid. And she was always more popular with the boys, and I used to hate her for it. I mean, really hate her sometimes. A police station? Yeah. When I was young, we ran away on my birthday. Bob Dylan was playing in London, and we thought we could break into his tour bus and have him take us with him. The taxi driver we paid to drop us off. I mean, we'd saved money, pinched a bit here and there to pay for the fare. He was suspicious because we were so young, so he told the police. So they came and picked us up and took me back to Portsmouth. My mum picked me up from the station. But I blamed everything on my friend Eve, so my parents let me off. Mum and Dad had never had any reason to notice. They were always busy. If Hannah was eating a lot, they didn't mind. She didn't put on any weight. That girl has a healthy appetite. Um, if they heard us talking in the and that Eve was our imaginary friend. <laughs> Once, she was already up and dressed and ready to go to school and I snuck down for a piss. Mum saw me in my underwear and she went mad. Get dressed this instant! So I ducked into our bedroom <laughs> and seconds later out came Hannah dressed and ready. My mum was amazed. Yes, we'd fight. We fought on the beach once and I held Eve's head underwater. There was no one else around. It was at the far end of the beach. And I held her head under 
and I kept it up to her. And for a moment, I just wanted to kill her and watch her drown. But that was it. It was just a moment. We made up afterwards. It was a love-hate relationship. My mother called me Eve. My name is Hannah. H-A-N-N-A-H. -N -N it's Pandre. It reads the same backwards as forwards. It doesn't work if you mirror it though, it's not quite symmetrical, but well, I mean, you get the idea. Sorry. Hannah Smith, I live at 31 Gladstone Street. Yes, my name is Hannah Smith. Oh, shit. <laughs> Sorry. Across the road, where my parents first lived there, was a midwife called Florence. When Hannah was born, I was born at the same time. The midwife was there to help. I'd been throttled by the cord probably wrapped around my neck by Hannah. The midwife told my mother I was dead. But I wasn't. She wrote all this stuff in a diary. Amazing what people will admit to on paper. Mm. She recognized me from the window. She told me to come inside and she hid me. They had made the attic into a place where Hannah could play. It was a dollhouse. She hid me up there. No one else ever went into the attic. It was her place. Differences? She's a better driver than me. She passed the test for us. I tried to take it and nearly crashed the car. <laughs> Learned that you can't rely on confidence to get you through everything. Mm. She is the shy one. She was especially shy around boys. If Hannah liked a boy, I would have to pursue him. It was that way with Carl. Hannah met him first. She had such a crush. I let him take my virginity after a night that his band had played at. It got difficult. When I was with Carl, we would have sex, but Hannah couldn't. Couldn't let him see she was a virgin. She had lots of excuses. After a while, we decided that I should take Hannah's virginity. It's not that different to a bruise, pulling a tooth, a graze. We used a hairbrush. After that, we took it in turns, though. I was always the one who seduced the boys. Until Simon. Hannah 
was so smitten with Simon, she started getting jealous, didn't want to share. Even the first date, we went to see Tom Cruise at the Old Odeon. We both went, kept changing places in the toilet. We only had the one best dress, so we had to keep swapping clothes. Must have thought we had terrible bladder problems. The next date, it was my turn. Um, at the end, I let him kiss me, but that was it. We didn't want another card on our hands, and the Ouija board had said to hold back. After that, it was Hannah's turn, and she slept with him. Broke the rules. Deliberately broke the rules. She wanted to be the first to sleep with him. <laughs> I mean, that's when she got pregnant. From that one time. decided there would be a wedding. And after the wedding, Hannah moved in with his parents. There was no way I could follow, so we were separated again. I stayed in the attic. It was hard. It's like I suddenly didn't exist. I would sneak out, but in case anyone recognised me, I started wearing a wig. Hannah and I would meet up in the park. I was trying to get pregnant, but I couldn't. I mean, I couldn't do it with anyone we knew, so it was sex with strangers, drunk guys I'd met in clubs, in parks and alleyways. I was 17. It felt like I was being punished. But it was Hannah who had betrayed us. I had to stop when one of the guys gave me an STD. When we met up, it was disturbing. For the first time, my reflection, she didn't look like me. She was fatter, flushed. If anything, I was getting skinnier. I had a hearty look sometimes. Hannah had a miscarriage. This was late in the pregnancy and it left her infertile. It felt like the universe had corrected its course. We were aligned to keep but given a full time. once a day. Not that there's anything much to say. No, I'm okay. Can I leave? 
Are you going to arrest me? No. They'd laugh you out of the building. A lawyer would make mincemeat of you. Are you arresting me? No. The store.